juxtaposition to this morning's uh, piece of talk about uh, exoplanets and the characterization of nearby stars, where we learned about the distances to the nearest stars, and, and now we're going to learn about the distances to very distant galaxies. Um, Zach will be talking about something called the varying acoustic oscillations, which uh, for people who like more physical scales, if, if the distance between me and Clara is about five meters, so you need to triple that, you need to increase that by a factor of a trillion to get out the Pluto. And then you need to increase by another trillion to get out to the VAO scale. So this is uh, five yada, meter, yada meters uh, <laughs> beyond uh, the exascale. Um, so uh, this problem actually began as, uh, this, this project began as, as an attempt to understand a very subtle effect from the early universe that we were worried might uh, impact uh, the fidelity of the measurement. But it then really took on a life of its own as, as uh, Zach discovered um, in the process of doing that first project, uh, a, a different way of, of writing the three-point correlation function has really been able to, to redefine how we uh, study the three-point correlation functions of galaxies. And uh, I think that's what he'll be telling you about today. I think the thesis is very remarkable in, in its uh, suite from uh, very uh, astrophysical things about the early universe to uh, quite a lot of mathematical discussion of of how we compute these statistics, and there's actually quite a lot of technical skill in there. Um, and then on to uh, actually measuring these effects in the data. So I'll just end by saying that as you, I think everybody who's in the department knows Zach really likes to ask, ask questions at talks. And at the end of the talk, you go and ask him some questions. <laughs> okay. so, thank, you, thank you very much, Daniel. As you also know, I like to talk a lot, but today I promise to end with at least 10 minutes for questions so people can pay me back for all of the you know, trouble I've caused over the last four years. So I also want to thank Daniel for the introduction. Daniel, for those of you who know him or know him by reputation, is an incredible physicist and has really also been a great mentor. So the introduction is probably the best part of the talk. That's the highlight. Um, it's all downhill from here, but hopefully not too much downhill. So I'll be talking to you today about sharpening our cosmic ruler using the three-point correlation function and baryon acoustic oscillations. So those are big words. They are technical words. They may be unfamiliar to many of you. By the end of today, hopefully you will know what they mean. So first, some acknowledgments. As I've already said, Daniel has been a great advisor. I think this cartoon from The New Yorker kind of summarizes that well. <laughs> he's, he's the wiser anteater on the left. And you know, I think Working with Daniel has really been like having your cake and eating it too, but um, no anteaters were harmed in this talk, and I think after this slide there will be no ants in this talk, so don't get antsy. Okay, so as you can tell, I'm a lot to tolerate, so I'd like to thank Philip Moats, my office mate one who tolerated me in a tiny office in Abelden for three years. Basically, I could reach behind me and touch him. I didn't do this, but um, he's taught me everything I know about LaTeX and a lot about physics, too, and a lot about work ethic. I mean, this is a guy who I live with, too, and he goes home and goes to his room and works for another three or four hours every night. So, you know, if I've done a number of papers here, I have something learned from Philip to thank for that. I'd like to also acknowledge my current office mate, office mate too, Josh Suresh, who was also actually my cosmology teaching fellow for the first cosmology class that I took here at Harvard. 
So Josh is an incredible human being, just a really nice guy, extremely knowledgeable about all of the cosmology too. We've had many discussions about the three-point function, and you know he dealt with me during postdoc application season, so he deserves like a medal of honor for this. Um, and I'd like to also acknowledge some of my closer friends of the CFA. Stefan Portillo, he's my longest enduring housemate, as you can see. <laughs> as you can see, he's excited about the finish. <laughs> um, we also ran a half marathon together, so this is him finishing that. He has a lot of endurance in many ways. Um, then there's my good friend Marion. This is her playing polo. She's in red. She's making someone from Yale cry in that photo. <laughs> um, and she can't join us today because she's off from um, getting money out of billionaires for science. But fortunately, we do have her mother and possibly her sister representing the Dirix clan here. So then I'd like to acknowledge my good friend Pierre. He also lived with me for a number of years. We've had many late night conversations about crazy aspects of black hole physics and what have you. I've learned a lot from him. Then Kate and Jansen are also two friends who have really supported me in my journey here. And I've just learned a lot from the conversations with them and really enjoyed knowing them here. And I hope that will continue. And finally, I need to acknowledge a good friend who I've known for nine years now, Bobby Marsland, who's pictured there. He basically taught me everything I know about physics. I was sitting behind him during the physics year, so I won't comment on that. <laughs> 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 that may or may not be the reason I'm here at Harvard. <laughs> yeah, so Bobby is a great person and just really taught me how to do physics from first principles. I was, I was offline and I'm still pretty bad, but he's, he's um, attributable for whatever improvement one has seen. So I'd also like to acknowledge the many people that I've taught with here. The first person I taught with was also the most senior person that I taught with. Many of you know him who also asks a lot of questions and talks. This is Erwin Shapiro. Um, he's been a presence at the CFA um, probably since before my parents were born. Um, and just keeping with him was incredible. It's where he got his PhD at Harvard in 1955. Um, then there's John Johnson, who also just taught me an incredible amount as a teaching fellow in his Astro 16 class. Masahiro Mori, the chair of the physics department who I taught with, also just is great. He actually has a piano in his office, which you can see in the background. So I took a leaf from his book, as you'll be hearing. Um, and then there's Doug Finkbeiner, who has been kind enough to tolerate me at his group meetings, teaching for him this semester, and also is the chair of my thesis committee. So Doug is really very forbearing to deal with me so much, and I appreciate that. And then I'd like to acknowledge two faculty mentors who have been really important. One is Charlie Conroy, who's been my official faculty mentor, and he's been very generous with his time and expertise over the past year. And um, he also brings nice warm fresh milk from his farm with the coffee. So there are a lot of pluses to talking to Charlie. <laughs> And then there's Alyssa Goodman, who was actually the first person to tell me I got into Harvard. I think she may have told me a week before I was supposed to know, but um, she's just been really nice and available to talk about all kinds of topics in the time that I've been here. So I should also acknowledge four postdocs who have been particularly important in the journey. Cameron McBride worked with me and Daniel for a number of years and is one of the founding fathers of the three-point function in cosmology. Up to what I'll tell you today, he had the previous largest measurement in terms of number of galaxies at that. And I learned just a huge amount about the three-point function from him. And there's Blake Philippe Burkhart. She's been just very generous with her time and expertise, currently we're collaborating on a project to do the three-point function of Gus. And she helped me a lot with postdoc applications as well. James Giachon also was extremely helpful with postdoc applications and just very generous talking about the science. And finally, Annalisa Pilipich, who also, it turns out, is super knowledgeable about the three-point function and has taught me a lot about primordial non gaussianity So finally, I'd like to acknowledge the other members of my thesis committee. I figured one picture of Doug was enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't want everyone to become distracted. Um, so there's Cora Dvorkin, who I first met when she was a postdoc here, and she has since ascended to the heaven of being a Harvard faculty member. So I think it'll be great, and I'm really excited to have her involved. Then there's Ramesh Narayan, who I um, took the radiation class with. It was very difficult, and I heard he's made it even harder since. Um, so you know, having Ramesh on the committee is very exciting. Then there's Avi, who unfortunately can't be here today, but served on the thesis committee before also leaving California to get money out of billionaires for science. <laughs> and finally, there's Lucia Verde, who in her year-long visit at the Radcliffe Institute has been extremely generous with her expertise about the three-point function. And really, I think, in her graduate work and onwards, she actually wrote some of the seminal papers in this field. So it's an incredible committee. I'm sure they'll grow me really aggressively. But I came prepared for that. I brought um, 
all 15 of my research notebooks. So, you know, if they have detailed questions, I have detailed answers. <laughs> and actually, there are a couple more in my office that I will get before the private girl in. <laughs> okay, so finally, I'd also like to acknowledge the incredible department staff that we have here. I would consider these people friends before colleagues, but they're incredible colleagues as well as friends. There's Rob Fulton, Peg Rillahy, Lisa Capella, and Nina Zaniville, and they've just been so great to me in the time that I've been here from, you know, the most odd and random requests that I've made to them to just talking with Rob during the afternoon about French music of the Renaissance, for instance. So these people have really made the journey special and I don't think the department would run the way it does without them. So finally, finally, I should acknowledge some of my close friends who are listed here. There are probably too many to list. Some of my students who have tolerated my teaching and my family who's in the audience. I'm very grateful that they're here today. And also my Harvard research family, the Eisenstein group and the Finkbeiner group. These folks have just been great in listening to endless talks about the three-point function and other stuff like that, and tolerating my bad puns, and today will be the last day of that, I promise. Okay, so dark energy, that's where I want to start. This is not dark energy, this is a sunset on a lake. <laughs> but I think you do have to imagine something when you think about dark energy, and it might as well be something beautiful. And I think this conveys two aspects of dark energy. It's kind of dark. Dark energy is also dark. We can't see it. And this also involves light. So maybe that's representing the energy aspect of this. A third aspect of this is that it's filling all of the picture. Just like this lake fills all of its boundaries and is pretty flat and homogeneous, dark energy fills all of space as far as we know. It's pretty homogeneous, evenly distributed throughout. And we believe it's driving an accelerated expansion of our universe. So dark energy isn't conserved. It's actually created as the universe expands. And that's unusual. We don't really know of other things that are like that. So in fact, dark energy is about 71% of the current energy density of the universe. This pie chart shows you that. Um, by comparison, the stuff that we're made of, atoms, is about 5% or less, and dark matter is 24%. I won't say too much about dark matter today, but we also don't really know what it is. We know a little bit more than we know about dark energy. So if you're going purely by the numbers, dark energy is 71% of the universe. So in that sense, it's one of the biggest areas of human ignorance. Um, and I think that's what excites me about it, that this is really you know, maybe a 500-year challenge for humanity. I mean, maybe it's not, um, but I think it will just be interesting to see whether in my lifetime or whether in the next five centuries we'll actually find out what the nature of dark energy is. But that's the ultimate direction of the work that I've been doing with Daniel to try to understand the essential nature of this mysterious component. So this is just a brief slide to give you a first introduction to something that will be important throughout the talk. We're going to come back to this a number of times. So this is just to lay some things on the table. The baryon acoustic oscillations are what is called a standard ruler. So what happens is, Roughly 380,000 years after the Big Bang, in other words, about 14 billion years ago, the cosmic microwave background forms. This is radiation that is essentially coming from that time to us without having hidden anything else. And so it's essentially like the blueprint for the universe, the pattern of density at that time, very early in the universe's history, actually imprints on this radiation, and we can see it. And this is just a picture of it. And basically, it has these hot and cold spots. The cold spots are in blue. The hot spots are in red over here. And those have a characteristic scale. It's about a degree in angular scale on the sky. And that is telling you about the scale of density fluctuations at that time. And so that acts as one ruler, shown by the little ruler there. Now, what's interesting is these density fluctuations actually see the late time formation of galaxies, all the galaxies that you can observe today if you have a telescope, and some even with the naked eye. So like I said, the cosmic microwave background is really the blueprint for the universe. And we see the universe at late times, um, roughly 7 billion years ago to today, for aficionados, this is redshift 1 to 0. And this little diagram here on the right is just actually a map of galaxies. Each dot in this map is an enormous galaxy that has the mass of, the mass of roughly 10 to the 14 suns. So just enormous galaxies. And these galaxies also have a characteristic pattern in their clustering. And by measuring that pattern, we can look at this ruler at another time when it's bigger. And so the universe has stretched from 14 billion years ago to today. And we can compare these two scales to actually measure the stretching. So this is the basic idea of the BAL. But as I said, we'll be coming back to this. So first, I'd like to just step through what are acoustic oscillations. Well, acoustic oscillation is just a fancy word for sound. And you know, 
I may be mostly a theorist, but sometimes I do experiments, so I thought I'd do a little experiment and just produce some sound here as a starting point for trying to understand what sound might be. So hopefully the microphone will work okay with this. Among you, that's actually the theme of Bach's La Damuste from the Mass in B minor. It's originally for violin, but that's a viola. So having now produced acoustic oscillations, let's look at what these are. Well, these are basically compressions and rarefactions in the air molecules. So this diagram is showing you these blue things are air molecules, the speakers emitting pulses of sound, just like my viola just did. And if you really focus on one of these rings, you can actually see that the little air molecule, the air mo molecules are bouncing back and forth. They're not actually moving outwards, even though the pattern of rings is moving outwards, that the individual air molecules are just bouncing back and forth a little. So these are oscillations. They're oscillating back and forth. And they're doing that because the speaker is driving these spherical sound waves outwards. So this is just a slice through you know, the, the plane, but this would actually propagate outwards in a sphere. So, this is if the speaker is continuously emitting sound waves. It continues to drive this pattern. But I now want to focus in on a single sound wave, a single pluck. So you know, you might think of that as a single note from the viola, or perhaps even a pluck. Well, I did a couple, but you get the idea. Each of these plucks launch a single sound wave. I couldn't find a good picture of this, but water is an equally good way to think of this. You can think of this person sticking the zinnia into the water, and that just launches this single little spherical wave. I mean, I guess it's more like a circle on the water, but you can see this wave being launched outwards in the water. So this is an image that I want you to keep in mind throughout the talk, this idea of single waves being launched outwards from a central perturbation, in this case caused by the flower stem. So now you should imagine the universe as a violin, or maybe the universe as a series of violins throughout space. This is again the cosmic microwave background. This is from the Planck satellite. And the zoom in is a late time simulation of the distribution of galaxies. Um, this is just showing you a computer realization of what our current universe is expected to look like if we could see it with perfect fidelity. And basically, each point where there's extra mass in the early universe is actually like someone standing there plucking a violin and it launches a spherical sound wave outward. For the aficionados, I think this is a Stradivarius. <laughs> so how do we understand how these waves get launched in more detail? Well, we need to step through what's going on in the first 380,000 years of the universe's history. So first, you need to know that the universe was a hot ionized plasma. So ionized just means that the atoms were separated into their components, electrons and protons. Electrons are negatively charged, protons are positively charged. The second thing you need to know is that light dominates the dynamics. For detailed reasons I won't get into, the light that's present in the universe is actually what gets to push around the regular matter. Um, and this diagram at the bottom shows that. So in particular, the light dominates the pressure. So basically what happens is that light comes in Electrons interact strongly with light through a process known as Thomson scattering, and the electrons move, and then the electrons pull the protons in yellow here along by electrical attraction, which I've shown with this purple arrow. And so in this manner, the regular or baryonic matter actually follows the light. The light tells it what to do. So just to orient you to where we are, we're somewhere on this tube. Where we're talking about now is actually very much on the left end of this tube. Let me pull out some light here for the laser pointer. Ah, there we go. So we're at this part of the tube. This is the time I'm talking about now. Basically, near the very beginning, in fact, before the formation of the cosmic microwave background. And at that time, the universe kind of looks like this although this is a bit more of a psychedelic representation of it. But this is by Edward Schinger at MIT, so I'm sure that you know, this is not under the influence of anything. Um, basically, the red 
the red regions here represent overdensities where there's extra matter over the average, and the blue regions represent underdensities where there's less matter than the average. And what I've been saying with this plucking story is that each overdense region will actually launch a spherical sound wave because basically it's created an overpressure in the photons, and the photons will push the regular matter outwards. So we're going to see a visual of that now. But remember, this is the picture to have in mind. A single pluck launch is a single wave. And so if we focus on the evolution of a single overdensity, and that evolution is called the Green's function, just a technical word I'll use throughout, it's just going to launch a sound wave like this, except it's launching it through the ionized plasma. That is the early universe. So this is a nice animation that Daniel created a number of years ago. And it is just showing the central overdensity, more density than the average launching this spherical sound wave outwards. And you can see there's material at the wavefront, and it propagates outwards. So each overdensity in the universe does this. Each violin of the billions of you know, violins, you should imagine, distributed throughout space at these early times are doing this. And what's interesting about this is this only works while the universe is ionized. The reason this can work is because the light is talking to the regular matter and pushing it. But that can only happen when there are electrons. Those are the things that interact strongly with light. So when the universe cools and becomes neutral, in other words, the electrons and protons recombine to form atoms, the light no longer is able to talk to the regular matter, and these waves freeze out. So that is what imprints this characteristic scale in the cosmic microwave background, and also on the density of galaxies today. So this is showing you the baryon acoustic oscillations in the late time matter distribution. Again, this is focusing on a single overdensity. So you should imagine that at some very early time, I plucked the string here at the origin, or I set up the density perturbation at the origin, and it has just launched this spherical sound wave outwards, which creates this bump at this scale where the waves freeze out. This is the sound horizon when the universe becomes neutral. It's where the waves have got to before they have to stop. And this is a, about 150 megaparsecs. You'll see a number like that recur a lot in this talk. And this bump actually is what we observe in the late time distribution of matter in the universe. Um, just to let you know what these two curves are, this blue one is an analytic calculation that Daniel and I did in one of our papers. This red curve is the industry standard numerical code, which solves a large number of differential equations to produce this. We understand why they don't quite agree, but the key idea is that there's this bump sourced by the sound waves. So the question now becomes, how do we quantify these features? How do we go from this qualitative picture of the violins being plucked through the sound waves being launched? and you know, this bump in the matter distribution to actually something we can use as a tool to measure the universe's expansion. So we use a tool called correlation functions to do that. So first I'll explain to you the two-point correlation function. Later on you'll be hearing about the three-point correlation function, which just involves three points. So the two-point correlation function just counts excess pairs of galaxies over random. So here I actually have a toy calculation just to show you how that works. Consider that these green Gs are all galaxies, and these red Rs are all random points that are just thrown randomly throughout space. They're what the clustering would be if you had a random pattern. And consider that the distances are quantized. So if I live in this box, then I'm separated from a guy in this box by a distance d. And if I live in this box, I'm separated from a guy in this box by a distance 2d. I just did this to make the calculation a little clearer to follow. So we can ask, OK, how many galaxies are they separated from each other by a distance d? Well, first we have to compare box 1 with box 2. And you can see that there are three possible pairs. There's this guy and that guy, this guy and that guy, and this guy and that guy. So we put a 3 here in this 1, 2, this column for box 1, 2, and this distance d. We can do the same for the randoms. And you can see there are two possible random pairs doing that. However, for a distance d, you can also see if I live in this box, I can be separated from a guy in this box by distance d. So if you do the same calculation, you can see there's one possible random pair there and two possible galaxy pairs. So I've just recorded that here. So now if we just total up what's going on in the correlations at a distance d, you can see I have five galaxy pairs separated by d, but only three random pairs. Now the two-point correlation function measures the excess pairs over random divided by the number of random pairs. So we take the number of galaxy pairs, which is five, minus the number of random pairs, which is three and divide it by the number of random pairs, which is 3. So we get 2 in the top and 3 in the bottom for an answer of 2 thirds. So that's the value of the correlation function at distance d. You can do the same calculation for a distance of 2d. And in that case, you can see the only possible boxes are this box 1 talking to box 3. 
because they're separated by 2D. And you can see that there are basically six galaxy pairs that are possible because you can have each of these three guys talking to each of these two guys. And there are two random pairs possible. You can have each of these randoms talking to this random. And so again, one goes through the calculation. You get the value of the correlation at 2D. So the point is, you can do this more carefully with a million galaxies or something like that. And you can just record these numbers at each of these distances and make a plot of it. And that is the correlation function. And that measures the cost strain of matter. So the BAO method basically is just doing that. Here on the x-axis, I've plotted the separations of pairs. This H inverse megaparsec is a cosmologist unit. H is just a number. It's about 0.7. The BAO scale in these units is 100. H inverse megaparsecs, I've marked it with this black line. And you can basically see the excess correlations above random plotted on the y-axis here and multiply it by the separation squared to bring out the finer features. These excess correlations above random have a bump right here at this particular scale. And the idea is that you measure this in different slices of the universe, which correspond to different times. And comparing this bump at those different times tells you how much the universe has stretched. So what are these crazy you know, lines with the dots and bars? These are actually the results from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. DR9 means data release 9. DR10 is data release 10. DR11 is data release 11. And the key point that this illustrates is that these vertical bars, these are the error bars, are actually getting much tighter. And in fact, the latest measurements using the BAO technique achieve 1% precision on the cosmic distance scale. So they're actually able to measure the distance to a time about 6 billion light years in the past with 1% precision. Now, I just think that's pretty incredible that one can basically, as precise as you can take a human being's temperature, you can figure out the size of the universe 6 billion years in the past, probably more precisely than your average drugstore thermometer. So I should mention, there were two groups that were the first to detect this BAO bump in a sample of about 46,000 galaxies in the case of SDSS, and in a different sample in the case of the survey called 2D FGRS. So one of the groups with this 2D FGRS survey was led by Sean Cole in England. They did this in 2005. And the other group was actually led by Daniel. And he did this in 2005. So Daniel has really been a central figure in the development of the BAO as a standard ruler. I won't say any more about that or he'll blush. But, um, and this data is actually from a paper by um, Anderson et al. from 2014 using the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So there is a complication here. This picture that I described to you of the overdensities launching pressure waves outwards, these sound waves, well, that actually means that the regular matter, or baryons, is doing something different from the dark matter, which I said I briefly mentioned in this talk. So CDM is cold dark matter, and that kind of tells you what you need to know. The dark matter is dark. It's dark because it doesn't interact with light. Therefore, the light can't push it around. Therefore, it doesn't care what the light is doing. And so anytime the dark matter sees an overdensity at the origin, which again, this is a green function, so I've set up an overdensity at the origin, the dark matter just knows about gravity, so it'll fall inwards. So I've shown here is the infall velocity times r squared. So here we have a 1 over r squared infall velocity, which is just what you'd expect from Newton's 1 over r squared force law. And what's remarkable is that the baryons in the dark matter are actually agreeing over here. That's because they're outside the sound horizon which is marked as RS here. Again, it's about 150 megaparsecs. And the idea is, if you're a baryon sitting out here, you actually haven't had this sound wave reach you yet, so you don't know about it. So the only thing you do know about is gravity, so you have to fall inwards. Meanwhile, the dark matter, as I said, doesn't care anyway, so it just falls inwards. Um, we do understand why it doesn't quite fall inwards as 1 over R squared over here, but I won't say much about that now. So this is to say that Outside the sound horizon, the relative velocity between the baryons and dark matter, just the difference between the blue and red curves, is zero. However, inside the sound horizon, the baryons are being pushed outwards in this spherical sound wave. And in fact, the photon pressure is so high that just like you saw the little blue air molecules not really moving much inside the sound horizon when the speaker was launching the waves, the baryons inside the sound horizon are basically at rest only right at the wavefront are they shooting outwards. And in fact, they shoot outwards at about one third, uh, sorry, 57% of the speed of light. And that's why you see a bump in their velocity here. So this black curve is just the difference between the red curve and the blue curve. And you can see it has this characteristic kind of sawtooth or triangle shape, where it's not zero within the sound horizon, but zero outside the sound horizon. 
this plot is just showing you the density structure. There's a red and a blue curve overlapping here. The red curve is the photons or light, the blue curve is the gas or baryons. They're tightly coupled to each other, which is because the photons are pushing the baryons around. And you can see that it's basically just this pulse that is not zero out to the sound horizon and then goes zero because it hasn't, you know, that's how far it's gotten. Meanwhile, the dark matter in black has been infalling, as we saw from here. So it's just able to build up this density structure that's really peaked at the origin. So this is the baryon dark matter relative velocity. And it turns out that it's actually about 10% of small halos circular velocity at redshift 50. So that's a technical sentence. Let's unpack that. What I really mean is that if you're a huge chunk of dark matter in the universe, and you're trying to attract regular matter to then be able to form stars and form a galaxy, you have an energy budget. You have some ability to suck stuff in through gravity. But if that stuff is moving really fast, it's hard for you to do that. And the point of this 10% number is that this relative velocity, where if you're a dark matter particle, you see the baryons moving away from you, actually makes it difficult for you to pull baryons in and form a galaxy. And so these small halos at redshift 50 are actually the progenitors of the luminous red galaxies that we use today for the DAO method. And so if the galaxies today have a strong memory of their progenitors, then the relative velocity can introduce correlations in them on the DAO scale. So you should imagine the universe as a patchwork quilt with red and blue patches. The blue patches are areas that have small relative velocity. The red patches are areas that have high relative velocity. If you're a primordial halo trying to pull in baryons and you're sitting in a red patch, you're in trouble. It's hard for you to attract baryons because they're moving away from you. Meanwhile, if you're in a blue patch where there's a low relative velocity, it's not so hard and you can form galaxies more effectively. Now these patches are actually roughly the baryon acoustic oscillation scale in size. They're about 100 H inverse megaparsecs or 150 normal megaparsecs. And so they're actually introducing additional correlations on the VAO scale, and this can change this two-point correlation function that we use to do the measurements. So throughout this talk, we're going to parameterize the memory of the universe by this relative velocity bias, VB, B for bias, V for uh, for velocity. And the idea is this could be zero. If the galaxies today have no memory of their ancestors, then this number should be zero, and we aren't going to worry about this. However, if the galaxies we use today for the VAO have a strong memory of their progenitors at high redshift, then this number is not zero, and there may be an effect in the two-point correlation function. So so this is just showing you in more detail what I just said can happen. Basically, we use this black line, which identifies the BAO bump in the two-point correlation function. We use that as a cosmic distance ruler. But the relative velocity shown by this red arrow can actually move where this bump occurs in or out. And if you don't correct for that, then you're going to systematically measure the wrong size of the universe using this method. That would lead to possibly inferring the wrong nature of dark energy, going back to where we started with trying to understand dark energy. So this is a more technical plot. Basically, it's showing you on this axis, the x-axis, the strength of the relative velocity coupling, the strength of the universe's memory. And on the y-axis, it's showing you the shift in this black line. How much does this black line move in or out? If alpha equals 1, then the line hasn't moved. Um, alpha different from 1 is bad, and we'd like to correct it. And here I've just drawn on the precision of BOSS, which is a sky survey that's currently completed, and DESI, which is a sky survey that's going to have 30 times the number of galaxies as BOSS, and is projected to start in 2019. And I'll be going to Berkeley to try to work on that. And basically, the point is that these black and red curves are crossing these blue lines. And that means that even for a very small coupling of the relative velocity to galaxies today, even if the universe has only an extremely weak memory, this effect can be a problem for the precision of these surveys. So in particular, these numbers are actually at the order of 1 to 2%. So even a 1 or 2% coupling between the relative velocity and galaxies today can completely degrade the precision of these surveys using the DAO method. So how do we measure velocity bias and protect the two-point correlation function? Well, how about triplets? So we're going to use a tool called the three-point correlation function. It measures excess triangles over random, and the geometry is shown here. You just have a triangle formed by three galaxies. You parameterize it by the two side lengths, r1 and r2, and the enclosed angle theta12. 
and you expand this in this basis that we're calling the Legendre or multiple basis, which basically says you have some dependence on the side lengths in this coefficient zeta L times some angle dependence in the cosines of this opening angle, and that's determined by these Legendre polynomials, which are just known functions, there's powers of the cosine zeta. And so then you can pick out each L in this sum and plot that L versus the two triangle side lengths that appear here. And so red represents an excess of triangles over random, and blue represents a deficit of triangles over random. So this plot is just showing you that. And basically over here, you have a slight preference for triangles that have one side of about 100 megaparsecs, and you have a slight non-preference in the universe for triangles with one side that's a bit bigger than that. So you're going to be seeing a lot of these plots. Um, and they basically what we call projected out the angular dependence. So this is the dipole, which is just saying, how does this vary with cosine theta? and we look at that coefficient. So in particular, the relative velocity actually has a very distinctive signature in the three-point correlation function of galaxies. What these two columns are is not exactly important. They just represent other physics that can enter the three-point function. But the key idea is that you can't combine this column and this column with any arbitrary amplitude that you want and have it fake this column. This is very distinctive and can't be faked by some combination of these. So this butterfly is what I'd like to hunt using the three-point correlation function. In fact, I had my sister just do a little watercolor that I thought it would be sort of nice to remember this by. So while we're looking at the three-point function, it serves us to ask, what else can we get from the three-point function? Well, it turns out there are also BAO features in the three-point function. In particular, this preference for triangles with one side of roughly 100 megaparsecs actually comes from the BAO. There's also a diagonal crease here that comes from the BAO. And really, these, all these creases in this plot are actually coming from the BAO. And this is as simple as if you have a sheet of paper and you mark a dot halfway through each side of the paper and you then make all possible folds connecting those dots. This corresponds to triangles with different lengths that are all probing the BAO scale. So you know, it would be a boring piece of origami, but for us physicists, it's good enough. So again, I had a watercolor rendering of this done as well. But I'll put this over my desk when I go. Um, so the idea is actually to use these BAO features in the three-point correlation function, and thereby measure the cosmic expansion rate. So great, we have two nice things we can do with the three-point function. Now let's do them. Let's measure the three-point function. Unfortunately, this actually turns out to be easier said than done. As you can kind of remember from the counting we had to do to calculate our two-point function, the two-point function scales as n squared, where n is the number of objects. The three-point function scales as n cubed, where n is the number of objects. So this is just as simple as if you have two friends you want to invite to lunch, say you have 10, friend, say you have 10 friends total and you'd like to invite two to lunch, then you have 10 times 9 options for those friends. You have 9 D combinations. So you can certainly do 9 D lunches in a year. I've, you know, probably spent 90 lunches at high rise with two friends in the past year. But on the other hand, if you want to have three friends come to lunch, not only will you not have enough room at high rise, but um, you now have 10 times 9 times 8, which is 720 different possible combinations you can do. So you have to do double lunches per year, which sometimes I do do, although <laughs> maybe I shouldn't. OK, so the point is. For the three-point function, this type of scaling is very not favorable if you want to do this on a million galaxies. So the question is, does the multiple basis actually make this better? And fortunately, the answer is yes. So remember, what we really want to measure is these coefficients that measure at each angular frequency effectively what is the dependence on the two side lengths of the three-point function. Remember, these PL or Legendre polynomials, they're just known functions of the angle that we wrote down. This is how we chose to parameterize it. This is where the real information of the measurement lies. So just to very briefly explain a rather technical algorithm, what we do is we use the spherical harmonic addition theorem. It's a beautiful mathematical result from the 1870s. You can assemble the Legendre moments from the spherical harmonic coefficients of the density field around each galaxy. So what you do is you sit on each galaxy in your survey, represented by a black dot here, and the particular one we're sitting on is this a white X. You bin the density field around it into concentric spherical shells. On each, spell you, on each shell, you take the spherical harmonic expansion into these ALM coefficients here. And then you can combine these ALM coefficients very quickly to form the desired Legendre coefficients, these data L on the previous slide that we were seeking. So you still have to do some work 
about each galaxy doing this expansion is order n, and you have to do it around every single galaxy. But basically, using this approach, you now have an n squared way to measure the three-point function. So I also got a watercolor done of that. Um, this is maybe more shy doll than cosmology, but. So just to summarize, we coded this algorithm. It works well. For our sample of 700,000 galaxies, it's 500 times faster than a naive triplet count. And it's only six times slower than computing a two-point correlation function. So we should be moving to a new slide shortly. <laughs> This is a very uh, impressive result, but it's 500 times faster. I want us to focus on that. <laughs> yeah, well, it's apparently not 500 times faster on my computer. <laughs> oh, boy. I think your postdoc at Berkeley comes with a free new computer. Uh, yeah, obviously doing a lot of the calculations on this computer was a mistake. I think I will <laughs> Obviously, I shouldn't be that near the data. <laughs> I'd ask if anyone knows a joke, but that's dangerous with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my sense of humor is a bit punishing. <laughs> Now I just want to describe the sample that we used to do the work I'm about to show you. Basically, we used what's called the CMAS sample of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey data release 12. Um, this is 77,202 luminous red galaxies. They have roughly constant stellar mass of around 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 14 suns. Um, sorry. <laughs> Obviously, iCloud thinks it's important. Um, the redshift of this survey is between 0 0.43 to 0 0.7, and the average redshift is about 0 0.57. This corresponds to looking back about 6 billion years in the universe's history. And this is done with the 2.5 meter Sloan telescope in Apache Point, New Mexico. And thinking we can do the right break, I actually brought a mechanical prop. So this is what it looks like. They plug <coughs> optical fibers into these holes, and they do about 300 of these plates per night. I think each plate has like 1,000 holes. So in terms of human Patience, this is a considerable achievement, and in terms of technical ingenuity, and this is part of the survey that's really been going on since, in some form since like 1995. So I now want to give you a brief BAO primer. This is what you need to understand the next couple slides. Basically what we can do to test for the significance of BAO is create this no wiggle model, which is a model with the large scale growth correct, in other words, suppressed relative to a pure dark matter model. Um, having regular matter actually suppresses the growth a little bit, but with no BAO. So I'm showing that on the right here. This is, again, the Green's function. If you had an initial overdensity, this is what it looks like today. And you can see it just basically has a bump near the origin, and there's nothing going on over here where the BAO would be. So in contrast, your with BAO model has this nice bump here, 
And the idea is, we'll basically fit templates that look like this and fit templates that look like this and see how much this one is preferred. And that'll tell us how significantly we've detected the BAO. So one other thing you have to take forward is that alpha is a contraction or dilation factor. We apply, once we've decided the BAO exists, we apply alpha to basically move this bump in and out. Just like if you're tuning an instrument, you move the string a little more tense or a little less tense, we can move alpha in and out to tune the right distance scale to measure the size of the universe. So you're gonna be seeing some plots that show you how much a particular value of alpha is preferred. So using our algorithm, using this data set, we've actually made the first high significance EAO detection in the three-point function. Um, this is just showing you that result for two different models of galaxy formation. The point is that these plots look basically the same. This is telling you that our detection significance didn't depend on which model we used, which is good. So this blue curve is telling you that the best fit data model with BAO is preferred to the best fit model with no BAO in this dashed red by about four and a half sigma. So these lines indicate significance. This is five sigma. And basically, you should be comparing the minimum of this red curve to the minimum of this blue curve. So this is actually telling you we've detected the BAO at four and a half sigma, and this plot shows a similar result. This axis is basically the square of the significance. So we're computing these sigma as um, this guy minus this guy and the square root of that. And again, this alpha is just showing you what distance scale we're um, finding is the best fit distance here. And so another feature of these plots to point out is that um, once you decide that you're in this blue model, that you really have BAO, the best value of alpha marked by this red star is actually lying in basically a seven sigma valley relative to other possible values of alpha as you move along the horizontal axis. This is telling you that once we've detected the BAO, we can do an extremely precise cosmic distance measurement using it. So this is just a plot I'll step through quickly. It just is the results of our analysis run on about 300 mock catalogs. These are just numerically realized versions of our universe that are made to match the geometry and size of the sky survey we've done. And this chi-squared is just a measure of how well the model fits. We had 200 degrees of freedom, so it should be about 200 if the model fits well. You can see that our red value for the data is fairly typical for the mock catalog's result. <coughs> this right-hand plot is showing you the significance of the BAO. The delta chi-squared basically tells you how much penalty a model without BAO pays over a model with BAO. And again, our data result shown in red is fairly typical for a survey of this size. So we didn't get too lucky in detecting the BAO at four and a half sigma. This was actually implicit in the size of this survey and the data set all along as these mocks show. So. This is now showing you our error bars on the cosmic distance scale. At left, I'm just plotting the best fit value of the cosmic distance scale we've measured. Again, data is in red, mocks are in blue. At right, I'm plotting the sigma alpha, which is the error bar on alpha. And basically, you can see that with regard to the error bar on alpha, we actually did a little bit better than you'd expect. We're doing as well as the best 10 mock catalogs for this survey. But still, 10 is you know, a reasonable number out of 300. I don't think this is reason to disbelieve that we could do this well. The key of this plot is really that this number here is one and a half percent. This is showing you we can actually measure the cosmic distance scale from the three-point function to about one and a half percent precision. So just to summarize, using the three-point function, we've measured the distance to roughly six billion years in the universe's past. These are the numbers we find. 2024 20, megaparsecs is an enormous distance, as Daniel expressed at the beginning. And we find overall 1.7% precision on this measurement. So this is the first use of the DAO method for the three-point function. And now the question becomes, how much does this add to what we knew already from the two-point function? So reconstruction is just a technique that's used to sharpen the BAO. I'll show you first these results before we apply it, and then these results after we apply it. Basically, this is a plot of the difference in the distance scale from its mean value taken over all the mock catalogs. On this axis, this is plotted for the two-point correlation function, and on this axis, it's plotted for the three-point correlation function. So the best aspect of this plot is actually what it's not showing you. If the distance information was correlated, you would expect these points to lie along this diagonal line going 45 degrees in this plot. The fact that it's not, but is rather just in this nice ellipse squashed along one axis, is showing you that at least before reconstruction, the three-point function is adding new information. It's pretty much entirely independent of the two-point function. 
So now the question is, is that true after reconstruction? Reconstruction just being the standard technique that um, is done to analyze these results? And remarkably, the answer is yes. Basically, there's still no diagonality in the axes of this ellipse. The measurements of alpha, this distance scale from the three-point function, are still basically entirely independent from those in the two-point function. So this means that you can put the three-point function and two-point function together and use them in combination. And we expect that doing that, you can actually achieve a sub-percent constraint on the cosmic distance scale. So to translate that to more concrete terms, this is equivalent to adding an extra year and a half to BOSS for free. So I did some calculations, and this appears to be a 4,300% return on my cost as a grad student. So you know, I'm still hoping for the free lunch. <laughs> OK, so finally, there's one more piece to our story, and then I'll wrap up. This is the relative velocity constraint. This is what we set out to do with that rare butterfly signature that I had my sister watercolor that I want to catch in my net. And that can actually negatively impact the precision of these BAO measurements. So this histogram on the left is showing our measurement of the relative velocity bias in our 300 mock catalogs and in the data in red. Now, let me emphasize, in the mock catalogs, we know the physics we put in. We didn't put in any relative velocity bias at all. In these mocks, the universe has no memory. So the fact that there's scatter about zero from this is telling you there's just some error in our technique for measuring this. However, it's small. The fact that this number is 0 0.01 means that the error of our technique for measuring the relative velocity is about 1%. So this plot is another way of seeing that we're getting 1% error bars. It just calculates the standard deviation of the relative velocity bias, um, marginalizing over some parameters that turn out not to be so important for the calculation. But again, the data is coming in kind of where you'd expect it to be from the mock results, and it's coming in just slightly below 1%. So basically, we find a 1% precision constraint on the relative velocity bias, which is sufficient to ensure that any systematic shift in the VAO scale measured by BOSS is less than a quarter of a percent. This is a factor of four less than the statistical error bars of BOSS. So it basically means we've done what we set out to do. BOSS can protect itself. Our technique can also be used for DESI. And the goodness of this measurement suggests that it will protect. Our technique can be used to protect DESI adequately as well. So I should just mention, our method is the most sensitive probe of the relative velocity bias. There are a number of other groups that have used other techniques to do this. We do better than they would do if they had our sample by roughly a factor of two. So I'll wrap up so there's still a little bit of time for questions. We've shown the theoretical signature of an important possible systematic of the BAO method in the two-point function. We've developed a transformatively fast three-point function algorithm. And using that algorithm, we've made the first high significance BAO detection in the three-point function, which enables a 1.7% precision measurement of the distance um, or the size of the universe six billion years ago. So this distance information is independent from that in the two-point function and is equivalent to lengthening BOSS by about 30%. So finally, we've also placed a 1% constraint on the relative velocity bias, meaning that any error in the distance scale that this bias produces is well below BOSS's statistical error bars. So thank you very much for your attention. pre and the post reconstruction images, what is that singular outlier? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> There's one that's like in both images. Mm -hmm. You mean down. this point at the bottom? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I actually don't know. We should look into that. It could be a mock catalog that's been corrupted, actually. Okay. Um, the reason I kept saying 300, but it actually said on the slides 298 is because already we found that two of the mocks the mm -hmm. data files have been corrupted. So that's something we should probably look at. On the other hand, I don't think um, this distance from zero is, well, I think one would also see this show up in the histograms we made as highly inconsistent if it really were, but yeah. I was wondering if it is, uh, it was, is it unexpected that there's no velocity shift? It's actually not unexpected because previous groups, this um, other group I mentioned found that already the relative velocity bias has to be less than 3.3%. And basically, this is because the luminous red galaxies we see today, the fraction of stars in them coming from these high redshift progenitor objects is just very, very small. So 
you know, they undergo a lot of mergers, they undergo a lot of feedback processes, and there are just a lot of ways that the universe's memory could essentially get wiped in this regard. So would that imply if you kind of keep extending this method out to higher redshifts that eventually you might expect to see some shift? I think it's possible you would. Indeed, one of the groups that works on this did compare two redshift slices, one at a higher redshift, and they asked, is there a differential effect? They didn't find anything, but they didn't have very different redshifts. Even the higher redshift slice they used was not that high. But as we use telescopes like JWST and WFIRST that can probe to much higher redshifts, I think it will be quite interesting to do these differential measurements and see if as you go back farther, there is more of an effect. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. Setting aside the computer issues, which are awkward, what have you thought of that the four-point correlation, fifth, five-point correlation, so forth, could offer in terms of cosmological insights? Yeah, well, I think we don't yet know, because if the field is perfectly against the random field, then all the information is in the two-point. Of course, we've measured the three-point, and we know that the evolution under gravity already makes it non-Gaussian. But I think we don't know how much information four and five point statistics can offer. However, the spherical harmonic things that I mentioned actually, we think, do permit you to measure four or five and whatever point correlation functions you want in a way that also fundamentally scales as n squared. So over the summer, I'm hoping to write the code for that algorithm and then make similar plots of just the distance measures from, say, the two point versus the four point, the two point versus the five point, and then explore you know, how many correlator should we be going out to to extract the maximum information from these cosmological surveys? To get the um, fast algorithms to work, what you're actually doing to assume that the distribution is homogeneous and isotropic and using that to drop the dimensionality of the problem? Yes, it does average over translation and rotation. Um, this is also an assumption that the theory makes when you do the predictions. In detail, this isn't true because one has redshift space distortions. And actually, we have incorporated some of that in the later slides that I showed you and the models we've used to analyze those. But basically, what one does is one uses the anisotropic redshift space models, but then averages them over all possible orientations to the line of sight. Um, I think in even more detail, we can actually, if we focus on particular lines of sight, extract even more information from these surveys. And that's also something we're working on. So the, um, I mean, this is great. The biasing that you use, so these B1 and B2 frames are used for these LRGs, you think are fairly well behaved. For DESI, they might, you know, the treatment of this might be a little bit different. Are you concerned about, you know, the type of galaxies you're going to see for future surveys, or this treatment might break down? Yeah, that's a great question. So DESI is using some LRGs, but they're also using ELGs, and that's just a different set of galaxies, extremely luminous galaxies. Um, they're, I think, younger than newer, and they might have completely different biases. So that's why I try to be a little careful in what I said. I think our technique just suggests that DESI can use this approach to protect itself. But yeah, it will depend on the detailed properties of the samples. And I think we'll have mock catalogs for DESI available pretty soon. And we can run everything through our pipeline and actually see what's achievable. Last one. Uh, Zach, as you know, from a non-physics background, I just had a, a, a brief question on the construct. So you, you're binning all of these things from distances based on triangles, mm -hmm. um, but then you always go back to um, spheres and concentric rings. Is there any way you could theoretically in your head conceive a construct where you were binning based on concentric spheres out from individual points and then keep on overlaying them with an advanced algorithm give you more detail? Yeah, so actually what you said kind of reveals the key of what we're doing. We really are. These spheres the radii of these concentric spheres are actually the lengths of the triangle sides. So the idea is what you would normally do to measure a three-point function is you literally calculate the size in terms of side length and opening angle of all the triangles. This is slow. Then you would bin it after you've done that. You've bin it um, in the side length, and you might also do some binning and opening angle. What we do is we do both of those binnings beforehand. That's what this expansion into the spherical shells actually permits you to do. It, it bins beforehand. So then you're only ever looking at combinations of bins rather than combinations of individual points. And you know we would only use 10 to 20 bits. So that's actually the essence of why this algorithm can be so fast compared to the naive approach. Thank you. OK, well, thank you.